Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the ongoing horrors in Gaza. Our guest, Jennifer Lowenstein, is former Associate Director of Middle Eastern Studies and Senior Lecturer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has lived and reported from Gaza and Beirut. Uh, Jennifer Lowenstein, welcome to Talk World Radio. Nice to be here. So you, you'd you think it couldn't get any worse or more dramatic, but there always seem to be new developments in the ongoing genocide in Gaza. What do you make of the latest? You know, it's getting harder and harder to comment because it's so terrible. I was watching a... Um, a post on Al Jazeera this morning, a show called The Listening Post. And uh, one of the people in the show said something meant humorously, you know, dark humor. He said, you know, they can't do anything else to us. <laughs> They've done everything possible. And I tell you, I, I don't want to say, yeah, because, you know, the Israelis are very creative in their torture techniques. Um, I, I sometimes am just at a loss for words. Uh, one other thing that I thought was chilling, actually, I was listening to Chaz Freeman uh, recently. He is a former US ambassador to China and a few other nations, I believe. He was very insightful. And he said that the Gaza Strip, as many people used to call it, was the largest open air prison in the world because the 2.3 or 2.4 million people living there are essentially prisoners. They can't leave, can't go anywhere. He said, but today that's changed. Today it's the largest extermination camp. And that just made my blood run cold because in a way he's right, you know, probably close to 200,000 people will have died when this is over. If not directly, then indirectly by malnutrition, dehydration, lack of medical care, lack of uh, sanitation, diseases, who knows? And, you know, if you look at the various tactics that the Israelis have used on Gaza, it's not all, I'm gonna kill you with a gun or a bomb or a tank shell or whatever directly. A lot of it is very slow um, mass murder. How do, you, how do you slaughter 2 million people? Well, you shut off the electricity, the water, the food and the fuel, that's one way. Um, people in the Gaza Strip who have high blood pressure or high cholesterol or diabetes or God forbid cancer, they don't have their drugs. Those drugs aren't available in the pharmacies anymore. A lot of those people are gonna die as a result. A lot of people who could get easily treated for wounds or, or illnesses in hospitals can't get decent healthcare because the hospitals have been destroyed. You know, it, it, the list goes on and on and on. What we take for granted in our daily lives, little things, people there cannot take for granted. They can't take for granted that when they go to sleep at night, whether it's on the ground inside a tent or along a street, or if they happen to be among the luckiest in their own home in, in a place like Deir el Bala, they can't count on waking up the next morning when you think about it, because many people have died at night when their home is bombed. Whole families have been completely eradicated. So, you know, and, and I should add from a personal perspective, I have many friends in the Gaza Strip, not one of them. They're all very politically minded, very, because they, they're people who used to work at a, um, excuse me, at a human rights organization called the Mizan Center. Not one of them has ever supported Hamas. 
These are people who have been critical of Hamas, who've actively worked in their human rights environment to curb the, the corruption or the authoritarian practices of Hamas. Their homes are gone, they're living in tents, they're worried about illness, they have children just like everybody else. So this isn't a war against Hamas. This is a war against the Palestinians of Gaza and the West Bank, just a lot more slowly. I was really, really struck, uh, Jennifer Lowenstein, by your comment that there would be 200,000 dead when it's over. I'm, I'm not sure we're terribly far from there now, but I hate to call that good news, but what are the signs that it's ever going to be over? You've got the, the finance minister of Israel saying he'd like to starve 2 million people to death, but the world won't let him. But what is the world doing to not let him? What, uh, what are the well, signs yeah, there's going to be an end? That's part of the problem. And I, and I want to just step back for a minute. The number 200,000 or more specifically 186,000, that was <clears throat> excuse me, that was a death toll that was given by The Lancet, the British medical journal, very prestigious Brit British medical journal. Um, and they are not the only ones to have forecasted this. That, by the way, was a low estimate. So when I say it's likely that 200,000 people will have died, for all, for all we know, that's a low estimate. And, you know, the people who have survived, whether it's unscathed or with some horrific war wound, those people are not ever going to get over this. They're not ever going to be free. So when you say, how is this going to end? Well, first of all, it's never going to end for them. This will be etched and in, ingrained in their memories and their minds for the rest of their lives. And we're talking about children as young as two, all the way up to elderly people. This isn't something you forget. Don't forget, people there have been living with this now for almost a year. In less than two months, it will be one year. So when, when people ask, when is this gonna end? I think that's entirely up to the United States. The United States could turn off the tap today. The, the military and financial, and political support that we've been pouring into Israel. That's the key right there. Israel is a rogue state. I mean, as far as I can tell, it's, it's totally off the rails. Its leaders are psychopaths. But the fact is they could all be stopped in a matter of minutes. Biden never had to do anything other than pick up a telephone and say, look, if this continues, there's no more, there are, there are no more bombs coming your way. No more weapons, no more jets, no more tank shells, no more tanks, no more anything. But he hasn't done that. He's done the opposite. He, he says, and lots of people repeat that, especially uh, the spokespeople like Vedant Patel and uh, Kareem Jean-Pierre, and John Kirby, they get on television and, and say that they're bothered by the, the number of civilian casualties and that the administration has repeatedly emphasized the need to uh, keep civilian casualties to, to a minimum. Who are they kidding? Saturday's bombing at the school in the Daraj area of Gaza City, more than 100 people were killed. And the Israelis keep claiming, oh, Hamas command and control center for eight schools that were bombed in 10 days. They never supply any evidence or what they did in the case of that school was hand over a list of, I think, ultimately 38 people, many of whom were already dead, many of whom were known not to have anything to do with Hamas and which even if there had been a handful of people in there who supported Hamas, the, the, the principles of distinction and proportionality prescribe any bombing of a facility, let alone a school or a hospital, when there are that many civilians in the vicinity. Israel has broken every international law that we can think of 
on in during this war. And is Biden picking up that telephone? Nope. Neither is Schultz, neither is Macron, neither is Starmer. I mean, they're not doing a thing. When you say, who are they kidding? I'm not sure they're kidding anybody. When you put out a story that you're bombing a school, but not killing any civilians, it hardly even seems meant to be taken seriously. It, it, it seems like a joke. And they have the majority in the US in various polls that want the weapons shipments ended and the vast majority of the Democrats that the Democrats want to vote for them. Uh, and yet they continue. Uh, and they continue to sort of openly lie about it without any real effort to, to persuade us. What, why? But that's, why? that's the thing that, that, that gets me too, is that this propaganda, the Hasbara gets ditched, or that's not the right word, dished out to us every day. I see it in the APAC uh, announcements that I get because... I'm a masochist and I like to see what they're saying. The sad thing is that there are people who believe this stuff, lots of people. And I, by the way, I read a poll recently, yesterday, I believe, that talked about the possibility of the Gaza war becoming a regional war. And I think it was less, it was about 41% of those polled uh, supported American troops on the ground defending Israel. So there is not a whole lot of support for that here. And yet you have the United States sending in the USS Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt up the Straits of Hormuz and into the Persian Gulf. I mean, we're, Lloyd Austin just ordered an attack submarine over there. You know, there's something very wrong. And I just want to say something else is that what's interesting is that in this country, people who are very critical of what's happening have, you know, shaken their heads and and tried like hell to understand it and often say this is the uh, the tail wagging the dog. This is Israel and Netanyahu, you know, leading the United States around. And and you know, the US is doing nothing to to reel reel in the the monster. But then you have people like Hassan Nasrallah, who is the secretary general of Hezbollah, who has openly stated as recently as last week that the source of this war is not Israel, it's the United States. And there are a lot of people over there who see this. And so you, I think both sides can be argued. I think there's some truth to both. But I tend to be a little bit more sympathetic to what Nasrallah is saying, because we have the power to stop it, and we're not stopping it. The U.S. government could certainly stop it immediately, but also provided the model for it, didn't it? When on October 7th was declared our 9-11 by the government of Israel, wasn't that an announcement that they were going to bomb schools, they were going to have torture camps, they were going to do whatever they wanted, because that was what it meant to have a 9-11? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people felt uh, a terrible foreboding because they've seen the kind of destruction that Israel can wreak over the Gaza Strip in, sub in you know, subsequent wars. But I doubt anyone had in mind what has taken place this year. I don't think anybody last October would have said that Israel would carry out a genocidal war in front of the, of the world. I don't think most people would have said, yeah, they're likely to do that. So I think Israel has even, has, has, has how do you say it, upped its own standards, lack of standards, you know? I mean, I've been to Gaza many, many times. I saw the wreckage after cast lead. I saw it after something called autumn clouds that was never even reported because it only lasted three days. You know, the devastation that Israel has caused Gaza just in these now minor wars is, you know, mind boggling. It's, you look at it and you just think, how do they get away with this? I remember in 2021, when Israel bombed the Jala Tower in Gaza City, that was the highest, highest uh, 
story building where all of the media, the international media was based, uh, used to be the BBC included, um, Ramatan, which is no longer there, Al Jazeera. I, I mean, they bombed it on the grounds that one of those floors was used by Hamas. Well, everybody I know who's ever been in that building said they never saw any Hamas in there, but that's beside the point. You don't bomb an entire building and destroy all of the international media, that should raise some alarm bells for a few people, and then justify it. And the US sat back and watched and said nothing. You. So now this year, just the last thing, this year, instead of, instead of just bombing the buildings, they've killed over 150 journalists. Yeah, incredible. No, uh, could, could any other country do that uh, and have the international media not go crazy as, as an outrage. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think the U S could do it and, and ignore all of the condemnations. It isn't right now, but we certainly don't exactly have a pristine record of human rights and respect for others when it goes, when it comes down to our foreign policy. In fact, I read recently, again, Chaz Freeman referring to the United States as having a diplomacy-free foreign policy. And uh, I tend to agree with them. We don't have diplomacy, we just bomb. And Israel is exactly the same, if not worse. Israel's us on steroids. Well, the US diplomats are people who gave the most money to the campaigns, they're not diplomats. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of them, but uh, Jennifer Lowenstein, you, you've, taught in a U.S. university, how, how do you teach this stuff and how are they? How is academia doing these days? Well, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons I am not currently teaching is because I lost my last position at a university. I won't mention which one right now uh, because of my politics. And when I was at the University of Wisconsin, the university I taught at the longest for almost 30 years, um, there was a lot done to try to silence me. But I want to, and, and I'm not alone by any means. There are people who are far more well-known, et cetera, who have literally been hounded out of academia. But, um, you know, it it's really mind boggling. I mean, everything, from uh, disallowing me from participating in any forum having to do with the Middle East because of my politics. I wasn't fired at the time, I couldn't be for odd reasons. But, it, but the other thing is, is that when you go in front of a class, I used to teach the history of the modern Middle East. So the 1890s to the present, I don't go in and teach my politics because I do think that would be the wrong thing to do. I go in and teach the history and the politics as well as I can from as many reputable sources as I can. And if students objected to some of my claims, I would tell them go find uh, some books on this subject to refute me. And first of all, nobody would ever do that because that involved actually having to think or change their views. At one point, I said the 1967 war was not a defensive war. It was an offensive war. And an entire contingent of my class got up and walked out. And my feeling was, look, if you disagree, find the sources that prove me wrong because I'm very open to debate. I can change my mind. I have many times on various things. I okay. modify it, change it. I grew up in, an, in a family that was very pro-Israel. Um, but my views changed because I read and I traveled and I worked and I researched. Other people can do that too. But what happens is that instead of having people come back and try to debate you like mature adults, they just go screaming to the provost or the president or whoever else, the dean, and tell them that I'm, you know, infecting their minds with a poison. And, you know, it gets, it gets very ugly at times. And it did for me 
There are people who would remember scenes and there's very little you can do about it. How many classrooms in the United States do you think have students being taught Israeli propaganda, being taught that all wars all of are expensive, them. All that of land them. had no people and so all Up of them. until the last decade, you could not take a history course on the Middle East without getting Israeli Hasbara fed to you, you know, in giant vats. I mean, that's what that's what is given out. Um, when people started to challenge that prevailing view and bring in facts and bring in speakers, whether they're, they were Palestinians or whether they were uh, Jews who had progressive views or whether they were completely people who just happened to be interested, anyone who challenged that view was either delegitimized in words, often by the university administration, or canceled, or fired, you know, or simply not allowed to come in. I mean, I saw it again and again, it's still happening. But in the last decade, there have been some positive changes. You know, I was very active, for example, during the second intifada. Um, uh, as an activist, as a writer, as somebody who is going back and forth to the Gaza Strip and getting, you know, a class full of people who agreed with you was difficult. You couldn't really do it. And you always had to face, you know, you could preach to a small room of the converted, so to speak, yeah. or you could simply be blacklisted and not allowed to speak. But it's only been in the last decade that we are seeing things like these enormous encampments and protests and demonstrations where people are saying, this is outrageous, this is unacceptable. You're talking about an entire people being targeted in a war that is being funded and armed and funded by, by us, by the United States. So there are changes happening and I'm very encouraged by those changes, but I'm not, uh, convinced that they've seen the 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 best yet. I mean, what I'm trying to say is the fight is not over. I think it could very easily get worse for anybody trying to speak that truth. It'll get worse before it gets better. You'd think that university's primary job would be to teach thinking and that civil debates between people of different points of view would be very common and popular. Uh, yet it seems that think. The, the debate is almost unheard of, isn't it? Well, it is. And I think that's a really big problem, especially because what happens is that you get university administrations who are given instructions from on high not to alienate their huge donors. And many times the donors will be people who are pro-Israel, who will say, no, we're not gonna give your university this million dollar grant if you're gonna hire a bunch of Palestinian professors or whatever the case may be. So, you know, it's very much like that in politics. We're seeing APAC outspend itself to defeat people like Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman and to me, that's scary. Money is preventing debate. Absolutely. That's, you know, that's a scary phenomenon and it's right in front of us and it's not just on this issue. Omar and Tlaib, not out yet, uh, but- They're unlikely to go out because of the, the constituents who elected them from their own districts. But, you know, the fact that APAC is going as far as it is going, someday there's going to be a real backlash against that. And I hate to see it because I'm sure it will include anti-Semitism, real anti-Semitism, not the garbage that people are saying is anti-Semitic. Um, but APAC and Israel will have brought it on themselves. And I'm not shy about saying that. Well, I hope it doesn't include real anti-Semitism. Um, it's not just academia. I'm looking at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which are supposed to be our official experts on genocide and yeah. identifying genocide and using genocide as an excuse to launch wars. And not a word, as far as I can tell, not a single word. Um, no. Looking at U.S. laws, it's not just Israel violating international laws and the U.S., aiding it in violation of the same international laws. 
but eight or 10 US laws violated with every weapons shipment. Where, where is our official? Right, with every weapons shipment for the last seven decades. I mean, you know, some of the arms control export laws and the Leahy law, that's nothing new. That's been around for a while. We've been violating that every single year because we're pouring $3.8 billion yearly into Israel. And, you know, only in the last two or three years are people saying, hey, the Leahy law is being violated. Hey, the Export Act is being, what's the deal? Yeah. And nobody's doing a thing. I mean, even Leahy today, says it now. <laughs> the day after, uh, I believe, Blinken, you know, or the administration okay the shipment of bombs you had the the targeting of an, a school in gaza then the day after the the bombing of the school on saturday where over 100 people died blinken gives another 20 billion dollars he okays it the congress still has to approve it and in all likelihood it will if you were unlucky enough to see the over 50 standing ovations that Benjamin Netanyahu got speaking in front of the US Congress, it's not surprising, but it is very scary. And Americans who are even remotely paying attention to this ought to take heed because we are becoming extremely unpopular overseas, especially in uh, the Middle East. Uh, Jennifer Lowenstein, we have about one minute left. Uh, most important thing I haven't asked about or how people can contact you and keep track of what you're doing. Well, uh, my email is Sarin J, that's S as in Sam, A-R-I-N-J-111 at gmail.com. And the reason I give it out is because I do uh, produce a listserv. I do send around articles across the field of media, all different media, international, foreign, whatever. I do have about 300 people already on this list who are receivers. Also, they can email me just to talk if they want. But, um, and, I, and I do write, I write, I was writing a lot more, but hopefully I will continue to write. And I have, unfortunately, a lot to write about. Sadly, that is true, but I hope you keep doing it. Thank you for everything you've been doing, and thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.